All right, before we begin our worship service today, first of all, welcome everybody. Good to have you all here. Seeing some faces coming back, which is nice, and some visitors and all. So wonderful to have you all here today. Uh, nice to have you folks who are watching us on Facebook Live as well. All right, a couple of quick uh, announcements uh, before we begin our worship service today. Uh, today we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, we now have the communion cups are on the back table. If you haven't picked one up on the way in, uh, please pick one up. Uh, and if you want to join in with the Lord's Supper, anybody who professes faith in Jesus Christ is uh, welcome to join us in the Lord's Supper. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Judy Callahan for doing such a beautiful job on the communion table here, so thank you so much. It was so nice. Uh, and with that, Memorial Day, uh, the American Legion ceremony is tomorrow at 10 o'clock down at Town Hall at the Veterans Memorial. Uh, I encourage you all to come out there. It's an in-person event, so you all can come out there. It's outside. And um, Jean, is the, Jean McKinney is the uh, Master of Ceremonies, and uh, I'll be doing the opening prayer and closing prayer, so uh, good participation from the church in that. This one is cool. Ice Cream Social next Sunday. I guess it is June 6th after church. So uh, it says, please come and join. So I assume that's everybody. So uh, good. <laughs> Definitely is me. So um, come on next week. And uh, Ice Cream Social will be outside of the Fellowship Hall. So another outdoor event. Uh, graduation celebration, June 5th, this coming Saturday. Bailey Dickerson uh, has graduated. Many of us have seen Bailey grow up in the church over the years, and praise God that she's now graduated. And uh, they're going to have a party at the Dickerson home on Pine Street, and everybody's invited. So uh, that's going to be a big time. Uh, ladies' luncheon coming up June fifteenth. If you're interested, ladies, in joining that, uh, contact Jan or Reverend Stevenson. And then the yard sale is coming up June nineteenth from eight to twelve. Um, if you uh, would like to help with that. I'm sure Lois uh, or Jan would be happy to talk to you about helping with the yard sale. And if you have anything to donate, uh, you can bring it by the church. If you can bring it by during business hours, that would be best because we can open up and put it into the closet. Uh, try not to leave it on the back porch if you can help it, because uh, then I just have to carry it all over there. So uh, anyway, appreciate that help. Uh, on Wednesdays, we have a uh, Men's prayer breakfast at 7 o'clock. Uh, all men are invited to come. That's bring your own breakfast, uh, prayer breakfast. Uh, Wednesday, 2 o'clock, we have Bible study in person and via Zoom. And then Wednesday night, we have Bible study, 6.30 uh, in person and via Zoom as well. And then uh, the uh, choir practice at 7.30. Then finally, there's also an insert here. I'm very happy to say that uh, we're going to be having a, a vacation Bible school this year called the Armor of God. And uh, yeah, you got the worth applause. So come yeah, yeah. uh, from five until seven thirty, uh, August second through the fourth. And there's lots of opportunities to support this ministry. Most important, be in prayer for the uh, VBS. Uh, secondly, volunteer to share the love of Jesus uh, with the children. Absolutely, and then monetary support for supplies. If you have to, if you want to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact Diane Sharp or Denise Willis. The information is there. So that's very cool. Thank you, ladies, for that. Any other announcements that we need to make before we begin? Yeah, sure. This Please has do. to do with uh, Bible school. Oh, that's Bible school. Kind of forgot what hat I'm wearing. Uh, the memorial wedding. I'm going to be handing out poppies after church if you'd like to have them. Oh, nice. Thank you. Poppies after church if you want one. Okay, great. You want to stand at the back of the It's going to be popsicles, but it's going to be poppies. Poppies and popsicles. Poppies and popsicles. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'll be standing back here. Okay, very good. Thank you, man. Alright then, can you do this away? With what's in my mind. First thing I gotta do is get my head set. In the book of Jonah. In the book of Jonah, chapter one, beginning in verse four, the Bible says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he laid down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call to your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. And the sailors said to each other, 
come, let us cast lots and find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast, they cast lots. The lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Jonah said, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Let's stand as we sing, I worship you, Almighty God. It's the number 146 in your hymnal, or the words will be on the screen. That's 146. <laughs> Church and not only our church, but there's some other churches that meet here, the Viva Iglesia Cristiana and the Gachin Baptist Church, along with all the churches here in Cornelius who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, the church worldwide and those who are persecuted, the Christians persecuted, our government, our leaders, our country, uh, the military, our first responders, uh, still remembering Fred and Mary and Baldwin, uh, who are uh, a little under the help. Uh, Henry and Doc Pender, whom we miss. Uh, Shelly Deweese, uh, doing better, I guess. A little better each day. A little better each day. That's good news. I still take that as a prayer. Uh, Wayne Adler, uh, the Akins or Atkins family. Jan Adler's children came home. So she was happy about that. Uh, Pastor Jerry Haynes' family. Pastor Jerry Haynes passed away. Uh, the family of Evelyn Holt. A few folks passed away. Uh, Carol Newell uh, uh, is at autumn care, and so remembering her, she's uh, not doing so well. Uh, Bethany Kaylee Vandershaft, uh, Kaylee was born uh, a little more than a week ago, so praise God for that. Mom and baby are healthy. Uh, Fred and Lois Wanky, I see Lois is here, and how's Fred doing, okay, or needs prayer? Uh, well, it's the exercise for his lungs. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, he starts chemo again on the 17th. He starts chemo again when? On the 17th. On the 17th. All right, we'll keep praying and I'll pray. Um, praise evangelizing at the workplace. We had a, a report about that last week. Uh, I had a Davidson College uh, for prayer uh, recently. The college had made a decision that the board, where it used to be 80% of the board had to be Christian, 
They're dropping that down, I think, to 20 percent. It used to be that the past uh, the president had to be a Christian. I think they're removing that requirement as well. So as that college, which was a historic Christian college, is now moving more secular, the board is pushing that way. And I think we need to pray for that college and all the students who are there. Uh, then I ask you to pray for the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, the annual meeting will be uh, June 15th and 16th, and so I'm heading up there on the 13th. Uh, so pray for me and pray for the Southern Baptist Convention that we bring glory to God in that meeting. Any other announcements that need to be made? Or not announcements, prayer requests? Praise Tom. Amen. 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 Okay. How is your yes. mom? How's my mom? Uh, thanks for asking. My mom is doing okay. Um, not a whole lot of improvement or anything. She's recovering from the fall. But um, other than that, kind of the same. Thank you for asking. Uh, yeah, Cassie. We went to Indiana last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister ended up in the hospital with cellulitis for three days, which put us back a few days leaving. Then on Saturday, we came home, and I said my usual prayers that I always say before I leave. And a friend told me, well, God must not have heard your prayers because we were in a bad accident on the way home. Five minutes from home, oh and uh, the car was totaled. We had not one scratch, not one bruise, not one. Yeah, so, yeah, so you prayed. So that is the praise. Yeah. That's right. And he heard your prayer. Yes. Yeah, he did hear it. Yes. That's what's important. So praise God. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Any other sort of prayer requests? I'm sure there's many. Let's, let's take this off the Lord's prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Almighty God. We praise you, we worship you, Lord, because you are our God, and more importantly, you are our Father. And as your children, Lord, we have the privilege to come to you each and every day to tell you what's on our minds, to share with you our, our joys and our hurts, our, our fears and our desires. And you hear those prayers, Lord, and and sometimes they manifest themselves in ways that we expect, and sometimes not. But Lord, however it is that you choose to answer our prayers, we know that it's right. It's right for us, and it's right in your will. So Lord God and Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your will. And I pray, Lord, that we continue to align our will with yours, so that we can see the glory of God much more clearly each and every time we act in this world. And so Lord, I ask you this morning to act mightily in this world. This world is in, in deep need of you, Lord, uh, a bold intervention, which is what we pray. And so I pray, Lord, for all those who have lost loved ones in the many wars and conflicts of this country, and I pray for those active service members for their protection, Lord. Lord, the price of freedom, as we always say, is not free. So we praise you, Lord, for giving us such wonderful men and women who protect this country and do what's necessary to just bless the world and keep them close to yourself. Lord, as we remember those who have fallen today and tomorrow and every day, be with the families, Lord, especially the children who lose moms and dads, that they would grow up knowing that the sacrifice they have made was ultimate sacrifice and, and, and worth it on a much bigger scale. So Lord God and Father, thank you. Thank you for being my Father. Thank you for being my God. Thank you for being my ever-present help at all my times of need. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. And as uh, we often say, we can no longer pass the collection plate around. Uh, because of COVID, but we do leave it on the back table. For anyone who would like to continue to contribute to the Mission Leaders Church, you're welcome to drop your envelope uh, into the uh, plate. For those of you who are at home, if you'd like to uh, continue your tithes and offerings, then you can send it to the uh, church via the post office box uh, 100, 20 Lynch, North Carolina, 28031, or you can go to the website and use the donate page to uh, donate electronically. Either way, I thank you all for your generosity.
the book of Psalms, chapter 16, the Bible says, the boundary lines have fallen to pleasant places. I have a delightful inheritance. And I would add, we do indeed. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 799. It's called America the Beautiful. We'll sing all four verses. 799. Sacrifices that you and your Son and your Holy Spirit made for us. You redeemed 
Jesus. You laid down your life for us. Go on this Memorial Day as we remember all of those that have made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We remember you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made for all of us. For you were you fully human, but fully God. Shed your blood. You died for us on the very day of our tomb. And on the third day you rose. The first fruits of the grave, Lord. The first fruit. Here lies our hope. Philippians, the Bible says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Be confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day Christ Jesus. Pray for us now as we try to sing. God save it. You're going to make it.
And now as David continues to beautifully play, let's prepare our hearts and minds to accept God's message for us today. scripture reading today is from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 through 12. If you are able please stand for the reading of God's word. Again this is Matthew chapter 7 beginning at verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts, or good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so many of you know that before I became a pastor, I had spent a little over 20 years in the health insurance industry. In my last position, I was with a division of the United Health Group called Optum Health. And uh, having been in this business for over 20 years, I had gotten certified to give continuing education uh, credits and, and, and seminars, and so I did that fairly often. And United Health Group would put together the classes, and then we would present them to licensed insurance agents so they get their continuing education credits. And in North Carolina, every two years, every health insurance agent has to have three credit hours of ethics. And so one of the classes that was created was an ethics class. And before we gave the class, uh, when they developed the class, we would listen to it, give, given by the guy who created it, and then we could ask questions and get a feel for the flow and that sort of thing so we could give a better presentation. Well, anyway, I'm sitting in one of these classes to learn about this ethics class that was just created, and one of the early slides starts out by saying, where does ethics come from? And then it has bullets and says, well, ethics doesn't come from the government, and ethics doesn't come from your feelings, and ethics doesn't come from the uh, religion, and ethics doesn't come from here, the community, or the society, and it just goes down the list of where ethics never comes from. 
and then the presentation continues. Well, we get to the end of the presentation, and the guy asks, does anybody have any questions? And I immediately raise my hand. And at this time, I'm in seminary, so this is going to be real fun for me. And I say to this gentleman, go back to that slide about where does ethics come from. I said, all you told us is where it doesn't come from. Where does ethics come from? Now, of course, I'm looking for him to say ethics comes from God, right? Only the, uh, you know, God can, can tell us what's right and wrong, what's true and false, and what's moral and moral. And uh, he goes back to the slide again. And I said, well, that's, that's not it, all right? That, that's not, you know, where does it come from? Don't tell me where it doesn't come from. So he continues to backpedal a little bit and, you know, try to divert or whatever. And I keep pressing him, asking the same question again and again. And so finally, in his frustration, he says to me, ethics are determined by the board of directors of United Health. <laughs> and I said, okay, okay, I understand. And that was the end of that conversation. But it was kind of funny because you know, here's this guy being pressed for where the ethics come from. And of course, ethics can only come from a personal, um, eternal being, God uh, as God, right? And, and ethics in its simplest definition is, is just the moral principles by which we live. And when we talk about the kingdom ethic, which we're going to talk about today, that would be the moral principles by which we live in the kingdom of God. And of course, all of that is given to us in God's word. And the kingdom ethic is summed up in the golden rule. All things that you have others do to you, do to them. And so we're going to see this here. And at this point in, in the reading, or in the, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew, we're drawing near to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount begins in chapter 5 and ends in chapter 7, and we're just about the middle of chapter 7 at this point. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is broken up into three sections. I would call it the kingdom people, the kingdom ethic, and the kingdom to come. We'll talk about the kingdom to come next week. But it tells us who we are and what we're supposed to do and where we are going. And the kingdom ethics section begins with verse 517, where Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. And this kingdom ethic ends at verse 712, which we read today, where he says, This is the law and the prophets. All right, he starts out by saying, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets, and he ends, this is it. All right, so we have this book ends, so to speak. And in between, we have the kingdom ethic. And the first thing in the kingdom ethic is our relationship with God. And we see this beginning in verses 7 and 8. So let's go back to there again. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, most often when we look at these verses, uh, it's interpreted as God will give us whatever we want, right? If we ask, we'll receive. If we seek, we'll find. If we knock, the door will be open. It's almost like, you know, with you know, the uh, heavenly Santa Claus up there. But that's not the way it is, all right? That's easily tested, you know? I, Lord, I'd like to have a Mercedes Benz. I think there's a song about that, right? But no, it doesn't happen, all right? That's not what the meaning of this verse is all about. And so if we want to understand what these verses are all about, we need to start asking some questions. Right? Who is doing the asking, the seeking, and the knocking? And then what are they asking and seeking and knocking for? Well, the who is pretty easy, at least in the context of the immediate reading. Right? It's Jesus' audience. When he says ask and seek and knock, those verbs are all in the second person form, which is you or you all. So he's talking to his audience. But what are they asking for? What are they seeking? What are they knocking at? Well, that isn't quite as clear. And so when we want to try to determine what is going on in a section of scripture, we want to look at context. So as I said, we're in this bookends of the law and the prophets. And as we look at it, we see that when Jesus asks his hearers to ask, he says in verse 6, 8, your father knows what you need before you ask. And then he goes on to introduce the Lord's Prayer. All right? He knows 
what you need. And what do we ask for in the Lord's Prayer? We ask for daily bread. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for deliverance. We ask for the things we need. So when Jesus is saying, ask and you'll receive, he's talking about the things that we truly need. And that illustration is even more clear when he uh, says about the son asks for bread and the son asks for fish. These are just basic daily staples of life. The food that the child needs. So the first thing that we would say is we are asking for what we need. Right? And Jesus addressed this earlier. You know, don't worry about your clothes and your food and your drink, but your Heavenly Father will provide them to you. And then we ask, well, what are we seeking? Well, what did Jesus tell the disciples to seek in the Sermon on the Mount? Seek first the kingdom of God, right? Right, seek first the kingdom of God. All these things, all these things you need will be given to you. Right, so when we speak about seeking, we're seeking the kingdom. What are the knockings? What does Jesus say we should knock at? Well, up until now, he hasn't said anything about knocking in the Sermon on the Mount. But think about it this way. If we seek the kingdom, and just kind of use a little imagery here, if we seek the kingdom and we find it in your mind's eye, what do you come upon? You come upon the place where the king is. And where is the king? Well, he's at the castle or the palace. And when you imagine this castle or palace, what is the next thing you see there? Well, it's the door or the gate to get into the castle. Or in the ancient times in ancient Israel, the walls all the way around the city had gates within them that you could enter. And Jesus will say in the next verse, verse um, 13, enter through the narrow gate. Right. How do we enter through the narrow gate? We knock, and it is open for us, and then we enter. So when we think about what are we supposed to be knocking at, we're knocking at the door to the kingdom. Once we find it, let me in. Let me into the kingdom. And what will happen? That door will open, and we will be received. It's a beautiful illustration of salvation. So Jesus is showing us in the Sermon on the Mount this kingdom vision how we are to live in the kingdom, this kingdom ethic. And we live, and in our relationship with God, we ask for what we need, and he'll provide it. We seek after the kingdom, he will reveal it, and when we knock at the kingdom gate, he will open it, and he will let you in. And this is our relationship to God. And this would be all well and good, and we could stop the sermon here, because it's nice, and it's about me. And I get to uh, ask and seek and knock, and I get what I need, and I find the kingdom, and I get let in. But the kingdom is not just about me. The kingdom is about other people. So now we've got to think, well, what does this have to do with everybody else? I know it's the I generation or the me generation, or what they call it, but it's not about me. It's about the kingdom. And this is where Jesus now introduces this last verse, verse 12. And the key word is therefore. Verse 12 begins, therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. Right? Therefore, whenever you're reading your Bible and you come to a conjunction like therefore, it tells you that it's connecting the previous thought to this new thought. Or that what was said before is connected to, to what is going to be said next. Right? I don't know how many of you remember Grammar Rock on Saturday morning, right? And it was that one was conjunction, junction. Conjunction, conjunction, what's your function? Talking about words and phrases and clauses. Do you not remember that? <laughs> anyway, certainly I remember that. But conjunctions, maybe that's why I love conjunctions for that song. But conjunctions are so very important because in your Bible study, you need to know that verse 12 goes with verses 7 through 11. And I know it goes with it because of the word therefore. It connects those two thoughts together. And so, what is he saying? Whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. Now we're talking about others. A moment ago, we're talking about my relationship with God. I ask, I seek, I find, I receive, it's revealed, and I enter. Now with other people, how do I relate to them? Well, whatever I want others to do for me, I need to do for them. It's what we generally call the golden rule, right? 
But it's more commonly phrased the other way around. Do unto others as they as you would have them do to you, right? The thought about how we want it done comes secondary, but in the original writing of Matthew, it's reversed. As you would have them do to you, do to them. And there's some distinction there, there's some difference there. And I think the reason is we have to think about it before we act. Alright? Think about it before you act. If I do unto others what I would have them do to you, I acted before I thought. But if I would have them do what I would have them do to me, then I do to them. Right? I think about it first, and then I do. And I think that's something a real important lesson. Maybe the best lesson of today. Think before we act. All right, but we see this, all right, in our analysis with our relation with people, it's based on the way we would like to be treated, all right? If we ask or see or not, what happens? God gives, God reveals, God opens. So if someone asks or sees or knocks of us, then we should give or reveal or open. Amen. You see what I'm saying? And this is throughout Scripture. We see in Leviticus 19.34, it says, Treat them just as you treat your own citizens. Here they're talking about foreigners or immigrants or sojourners, however you're aliens, whatever you want to translate it as. Love foreigners as you love yourselves, because you were foreigners one time in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Right? Our relationship towards other people is not only given to us here in Scripture, but it's also part of our own experience. As it is written here, you were once foreigners in Egypt, so have empathy for those people who are foreigners in your Israel, in the context. But for us, we were once lost and far from God. Right? There was a time when I wasn't saved and I was far from God. Right? And I remember those days. And now I have empathy or should have empathy towards those who are far from God. Right? And so if they start to ask, I'll give them. If they start to seek I'm going to help reveal it. And if they say, can I enter the kingdom? You bet. You can. The way I wanted the Lord to treat me, I need to treat other people. So if someone asks you what they need, give it to them. If someone seeks the kingdom, make it easy for them to find it. And if someone knocks on the door of the kingdom, open it up for them. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a great illustration of missions. We go out, and we, we've done a lot this year, even with COVID. I mean, just recently we had the vaccination club, all right? That was bringing the community in. We had one gentleman who came forward and gave his life to Christ as a result of that, all right? He came here for something he needed. He asked about it, and we told him about the kingdom. And then he came forward, knocking on the door, and what did we do? We opened the door to him. He got saved. That's what I'm talking about. All right, this is the whole lesson of Scripture. And Jesus sums this all up at the end here. At the end of verse 12, he says, this is the law and the prophets. And he ends this whole section by saying, this is it. What is this? The golden rule. The golden rule is the law and the prophets. All of the Old Testament Scripture is pointing us toward this one thing. To think about what we would want others to do to us so that we do it also to them. It's about our relationship with God and our relationship with others. In Matthew 22, when we eventually get there, we're going to see Jesus gets asked, what is the greatest commandment? And his response is, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he adds on it, and love your neighbor as yourself is the second. And he says at that time, this is the law and the prophets. Or all, excuse me, all the law and the prophets hang on these two. So all the law and the prophets hang on loving God and loving your neighbor. And the equation of the law and the prophets is the golden rule, and the golden rule hangs on this idea of loving your God and loving your neighbor. You can't love your neighbor if you don't love God. And you don't demonstrate you love God if you don't love your neighbor. Paul says in Romans 13, uh, verses 8 and 9, he says, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Couldn't be any more clear there. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment, 
love your neighbor as yourself. Right? It's multiple times we've seen scripture. If you want to boil down the scripture, what is it about? Loving God, loving your neighbor. And how do we love our neighbor? We do unto them as we would have them do to us. So if we're going to live by the kingdom ethic, we have to love God and love our neighbor. And our guide to consider how we want others to treat us is to treat them the way we would be treated. And so, it's a very simple call to action today. When you're dealing with the world, you give to those who ask, as God has given to you. You reveal the kingdom to those who are seeking it, as God has revealed it to you. And you open the door to the kingdom, as God has opened it to you. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. Folks need and we give, and if they seek and we reveal the scripture, and if they knock and they want to come in and open the door, the more and more folks get saved. And that's why we're here. All right? We are here to make disciples, all right? to grow people up in Christ, to become deeper and deeper in our walk with Christ. I pray that each one of you feel like you're growing day by day. We're going to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper at this time. Anyone who is a professing believer in Jesus Christ can participate. If you have not picked up a communion cup, um, can I get you to bring them one? Anybody who doesn't have a communion cup, raise your hand. Terry needs one. A couple up front. I need three. I got mine. While Denise is doing that, let me say a word or two about communion. The, the word itself, communion, means to be together. All right? We do this as we come together. Right? It's so important for in person worship that we come together as the body of Christ. There's different views on the communion, or some call it the Lord's Supper, and when I was a Roman Catholic, we called it the Eucharist. Uh, came from the Greek word Eucharisto, which means to give thanks. And that's what Jesus does. He gives thanks to the Father for the bread and the drink. Now in the Baptist tradition, we have what's called the memorial view. We focus on Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me. Right? The bread is just bread. The drink is just drink. There's nothing magical about it or hocus pocus or whatever you want to call it. It is just that. But we're doing this in memorial. Right? We base that also in the Passover. We look back to the Passover. The Passover was a memorial meal. Remember the mighty acts of God as he brought the people out of the bondage of slavery and into the promised land. And the Old Testament truth pointed forward to a greater truth in the New Testament. That we have been freed from slavery, not physical bondage, but slavery to sin. And we are on our way to the promised land, which is heaven. And so when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we give thanks. One, for the salvation that we've received, that comes only through the broken body of Christ, which is represented by the bread, and the blood of Christ, which is represented by the drink. And then we also look forward to the day when we will all enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there's a lot of significance to the Lord's Supper. And of course, it's named the Lord's Supper because it's modeled after the Last Supper that Jesus celebrated with his disciples, which of course was a Passover Seder, a Passover meal. And so that's how it all ties together. And so as we begin, I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Beginning at verse 23, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he said, This is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Right, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Okay. 
full of drinking gas, but it <laughs> you see if you drop it, no one will know that I drop it, all the world sees it right away. It'll become a meme. Anyway. Continuing in first Corinthians eleven verse twenty-five. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you. In closing, Paul writes, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. It's been, uh, I guess, traditional for us as we uh, close the Lord's Supper to end with the Lord's Prayer. So I'll ask you all to stand so that we might recite the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, if you're comfortable holding your hands in the first place, that's wonderful. If it's not, that's okay at this time. Join me for a few words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and go out there and give and reveal. Open the doors. Amen. Amen.